Hello, this is Dennis Polis. Welcome to another Open Philosophy video. In this video, we're going to be considering the topic of generalization, that is to say, induction, moving from the particular to the general, from our experience to universal propositions. This is important because how we move from our experience to general propositions is the basis of much of the controversy about such things as metaphysics, the existence of God, the existence of the soul, the foundations of mathematics, and many, many other topics. So let's begin by considering a classic case, looking at crows and finding that everyone we look at is black. This might lead us to believe that all crows are black. The analysis of this move, the move from seeing only black crows to the conclusion that all crows are black, was analyzed by David Hume and John Stuart Mill. The result was the Hume-Mill model of induction. Of course, there's no logical justification whatsoever for thinking that all crows are black because the ones we've seen so far are black. What Hume did, however, was explain why we have the feeling that all crows are black. Because all of the crows that we've seen are black, we come to associate blackness with crows. We may even think that there is some rule or law which causes crows to be black. That allows us to make a hypothesis, namely the hypothesis that all crows are black. However, we know that there is no necessity to this, and that at any moment experience could prove us wrong. So we can characterize the Hume-Mill model of induction in the following way. We start with inadequate data. We have a psychological motivation, but not a logical justification. We extend the data by adding a hypothesis, and as a result, our conclusion can be falsified at any time. Now I want to talk about a different way of thinking about our experience of crows, one that illustrates a model of induction developed by Thomas Aquinas, and which is based on the idea of abstraction. Instead of thinking about imaginary and unseen crows, we can concentrate on the real crows that are actually in front of us and see what reality has to tell us. One of the things that we can do, a simple thing, is to count the crows. We see that there are two crows on the left and two more crows on the right. Then we can count them all together and find out that there are four crows. We can do the same thing with June bugs and potatoes and pennies and teddy bears and find out that no matter what we count, we have 2 plus 2 always giving us 4. So just as in the case of seeing many instances of black crows, we go from something which is repeatable and repeated to a general conclusion which we assume to be universal. However, there's a difference. We are much more certain that 2 plus 2 equals 4 always and everywhere than we are that all crows are black. And this difference in certitude must indicate some difference in mechanism. Let's look at what that difference is. When we count something, we don't really care what it is that we're counting. We only care that it's a countable unit. So we ignore all of the other properties of the crows, the fact that they're black, alive, birds, and so on and so forth, and concentrate solely on their one property of being countable. That's abstraction, and it's a subtractive process. Unlike the Hume-Mill model, we don't add a hypothesis. We take away irrelevant details. So everything that we use is already in the data. Everything that we see is in our experience. We've added nothing. We've hypothesized nothing. All that we've done is throw away irrelevant details. So to summarize Thomistic abstraction, we begin with adequate data. As a result, our conclusion is logically justified. Instead of adding a hypothesis, we remove distractions. We abstract away things which are irrelevant. As a result, we reach a necessary conclusion. And being a necessary conclusion rather than a hypothesis, it cannot be falsified. The idea that abstractions are not falsifiable bothers those who are narrowly trained in the scientific method. 
They've been trained that every hypothesis has to be falsifiable to be legitimately scientific. And that's true. The problem is that abstractions are not hypotheses. How would you falsify the fact that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4? Whenever we perform an experiment, we interpret the results by using logic and mathematics. We assume that logic preserves truth and that mathematics is valid. So if we were going to verify or falsify that 2 plus 2 equals 4, we would have to assume mathematics, and in assuming mathematics, we would assume that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. Therefore, it cannot be falsified. But that's not a problem because we know it's true. We know that it's true because it depends only on things being countable. It is solely in virtue of the fact that our black crows were countable that we found that 2 plus 2 more was 4 crows. The same process would work for anything that is countable. So all that we need for 2 plus 2 equals 4 to apply is that we be working with countable objects. In his commentary on Boethius de Trinitate, Thomas Aquinas outlined three degrees of abstraction which underpinned the science of his time. He thought that the abstraction of objects as changeable underpinned the philosophy of nature, that the abstraction of being as quantifiable, as extended and countable, underpinned mathematics, and that the abstraction of being as being underpinned metaphysics. Now we have a science of mathematical physics, and we can underpin that with the abstraction of motion as quantifiable. So, in this view, there is no a priori knowledge. All of our knowledge of mathematics, logic, metaphysics, and so on, comes from experience via abstraction. Metaphysics is not speculation. Metaphysics is thinking about being as being about things as they exist, what it means to exist, and that comes directly out of our experience of every object that we encounter. Next time I'll look at the experiential basis for some basic metaphysical ideas, the idea of existence, of essence, and of essential causality. Thank you for watching. See you then.